This is an episode of the Rainers podcast that I am especially proud to have been a part of. Myself, Kyle Cuthbertson, Kevin Rollins, and David Land got to talk to one of the most iconic names uh, in the history of motorsports broadcasting, Bob Varsha. Uh, we got to go over some of his really catching stories from over the past 30 plus years that he's been involved in the sport. And at the end of the episode, we got to answer some of your questions as well. Uh, if you enjoy this episode, you can check out the rest of them by clicking the card at the top right of the YouTube video. It'll bring you to our playlist of all the other episodes. You can also check us out on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Just subscribe to us there so you don't miss a future episode. Other than that, we hope you all enjoy listening as much as we did recording this episode. It's been a great time. Uh, probably my favorite one to date. So anyways, without further ado, enjoy. Season 2, Episode 2 of the Rain Race Podcast here today. This is all part of a segment called the Rain Race Podcast Spotlight. Today, the spotlight is on none other than Bob Varsha, a name that is synonymous with motorsports fans all across the United States. He has an over 30-year pedigree in motorsports commentary through F1, IndyCar, Formula E, and sports cars. Bob, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. We have a lot of questions to go over during this episode. Some of them were asked by you guys over on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, but before we do that, if you've listened to this style of show before, uh, we basically go over the entire career from start to finish, or from start to current, I should say. Starting off here, Bob, I just want to talk about this. You actually started off uh, with the aspirations to have a professional career uh, with law. Yep, that's exactly right. I graduated from college in 1973 and thought I wanted to be a lawyer, so I applied to law schools and wound up uh, and went to school there, graduated, joined the Georgia Bar, and was practicing law for about four years. But I was, uh, I was also a, uh, a runner in college, and I continued my athletic career after it. So I got involved with the Atlanta Track Club, which is a very big organization down here in the South. I became the head of the track club, which gave me the responsibility to organize a big annual foot race we had down here called the Peachtree Road Race. Every 4th of July, we get about 65,000 people running a 10K down Main Street. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years, and uh, we shook hands, and I walked back to, uh, to practicing law. And I had done uh, – actually, I got a call from Turner Broadcasting – in 1979, they wanted to televise the race, and they needed somebody who knew about the race because none of their stick and ball guys knew anything about it. So somehow they got my name. I don't know how. Cast, I did it. And about six weeks later, they asked me if I wanted a part-time job with, uh, with Turner, which was a very small company then. CNN had just started organized what they called CNN2, which became Headline News and, and uh, has evolved from there. So basically, I, I did both, practicing law and being a TV guy, and I went full-time, uh, which I've never regretted. While I was at Turner, uh, I got approached about a, a job with a startup independent program called Motor Week Illustrated. In the air in 1982, hosted by Dave Despain with uh, Ken Squire and, uh, gosh, Jerry Garrett and Jim Roller and a whole bunch of guys, none of whom I knew before – I walked in and became an instant expert on motorsports. Actually, I went full-time with them, and they sent me off to all the old IMSA Camel GT sports car races. And uh, that's where my learning curve really got steep. And while I was there, I met the guys from ESPN. They asked me to come work for them, so I did that for about a decade with Speed Vision, uh, which became a Fox network, and... Um, I left there a couple of years ago, and that brings us up to the present. I have to ask, you just recently brought up um, your position on Motor Week Illustrated. I was going to save all these questions for the end, but this one kind of ties right in. We had a question from Stephen Kilsdonk who asked, he said, you appeared on uh, shows in the 80s such as Motor, Motor Week Illustrated and The Speed Report uh, over the span of roughly 30 years. Uh, there's been programs such as RPM Tonight, TNN's Race Day, and Speed Week as well. What are your thoughts on the current absence of a weekly racing news and highlights program? Well, I think it's a shame, in short. I mean, you know, everything on TV is cyclical. Some things are fashionable, then they go out of style, and then someone has the bright idea to bring a similar thing back again. I've been a, you know, a little bit of a lull in terms of motorsports on TV right now. The big events are on and always will be on. A little more fractured, as we've seen with 
gosh, just about everything. IMSA, IndyCar, NASCAR. Um, you know, that it, it just kind of depends on where the network thinks its resources ought to go. A news program, a weekly, at the very least, maybe even nightly, program would be uh, would be popular. But um, evidently, nobody in a position to make it happen agrees with me. So, I mean, I think when you think about Speed Vision and what it was, it was a brilliant idea that Roger Werner put together way back in the day. I think that his concept has been proven. You know, when Fox took Speed and turned it into Fox Sports 1, sort of an ESPN fighter rather than the motorsports and automotive channel that it was, uh, I think it's fair to say they lost viewership. It was a it was a better, more productive, more lucrative uh, network as the automotive channel speed that we all loved working for. But yeah, I think you did a great job tying it up there. I think the great thing that a lot of automotive fans loved was that speed was pretty much just one common hub. They called themselves the Motorsports Authority. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nowadays nowadays we have still a lot of these races and auto shows on TV. Uh, but they're all yeah. split up amongst different channels. I know NBC has a lot of motorsports nowadays. In fact, they hold most of the market nowadays in terms of series. Uh, the only exception is really being ESPN, uh, NASCAR, Formula E, and they have half of NASCAR. So, um, mm -hmm. but and then you have your auto-related shows, the car auctions, Barrett Jackson. That's all seemingly on Motor Trend now. I think Fox still has a couple Barrett Jackson shows. I might be wrong on that. Um, yeah, you are. They're actually all on uh, Velocity, Discovery. Yep. Actually, the Motor Trend Network is uh, is where you'll find Barrett Jackson. Now. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all split up amongst different networks nowadays. So it's kind of a little bit of a shame uh, to lose that common hub that was Speed uh, in the name of mm -hmm. Fox Sports 1. But I do want to jump back quickly to uh, when you were talking about your break with ESPN when you joined them in 1986 for their coverage of Formula 1 and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I think one of the coolest things about interviewing you today is that I'm interviewing somebody who had the privilege of commentating drivers like Ayrton Senna, Alain Prost, Nigel Mansell on the Formula One circuit. I mean, I'll talk to possibly many great names on this podcast over the months, um, but I think that that's something that's really special about you. Is you were the, the voice that American Formula One fans heard uh, commentating these battles between uh, Alain Prost and Ayrton Senna. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, it was definitely a great time in my career. Back in the day, we actually traveled to every single race. And as your your audience may know, that nowadays, for financial and other reasons, uh, a lot of television gets done from remote locations, and the broadcasters aren't actually on site. But is you know, we used to talk face to face with the Mansells and Prosts and Senna's and PK's of the world, and, and I'll always uh, treasure those days. I also thought it was quite interesting that you were able to see Michael Schumacher grow from the driver who just started off with Benetton, and then he mm -hmm. worked his way up to the record-holding Formula One driver that he's known as today. That's true. Of course, it, it began with uh, Eddie Jordan's team for a one-off race at spa Frankershaw. Yep. Next race, the ownership of Benetton, spotting a potential superstar when they saw one they managed to scoop him up and get him under contract and yeah there's um there's been a lot of highlights and sadly a few lowlights in my career accident at imola points two and, and those are the ones as well you've also worked with some incredible legends as well i mean chris economaki uh sam posey david hobbs uh gary gerald uh, uh danny sullivan i mean Legends oh, in, in, in you forgot in, one. Who can forget the memorable Alan DeCadney? Alan DeCadney. <laughs> well, yeah, but sure. But you you've worked with some of the the most uh, prolific uh, broadcasters. Just just talk a little bit about that because I'm fascinated. Like, I mean, you and Chris Economaki did Formula One races and Le Mans, and I think you guys did like a bump day at Indianapolis one year. I mean, it's just crazy. Had a lot of great booth partners, I must say. My very first Formula One race was Austria in 1987, and I was there because Jackie Stewart was unavailable. You know, Jackie was used to the the big network broadcast level of budgets and and super hotels and private jets and all that kind of stuff. Well, he was working for ESPN now, and and we were cable. It's were very different. 
And uh, Jackie kind of got tired of the gypsy cable existence and just decided he didn't want to do Austria. So I got called in at a moment's notice. It's Economaki and John Bisignano in, in uh, Austria. And over the first two red flag races in Formula One history, Ash lap one, full stop, everybody go back to the garage, bring out the backup cars, and big crash, red flag. I think we went about three hours before we actually saw a green flag lap. So uh, Chris and I and John got to know each other really well as we killed all that time. The race started, and thankfully, uh, Austria was very fast track, and Nigel Mansell came through and won the race. But that, the legendary Keith Jackson got ill in 1991, I believe, at Monaco. And that was the one Formula One race that ABC over to its sister company, ESPN. Uh, and with Keith Jackson in the hospital with some kind of a medical problem, they called me in to partner Stuart and, once again, John Bisignano. So that was my first Monaco. It was a real eye-opener for me. I remember going to the announce booth and arts and graphs and historical notes and all that kind of stuff, and I dump it all on the counter, and in comes Sir Jackie Stewart, who puts down a blank legal pad and a pencil. Jackie is so severely dyslexic that he can't have a briefing book in front of him. He takes notes, and that's how he keeps things in mind. But uh, that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. And, and, you know, he's one of the one of the greats, you're right, that I worked with. And, and I did a lot of other sports, too. So I spent time around other great athletes like Dwight Stones and Daley Thompson, Olympic gold medalists, Peekaboo Street, you name it. It was... Um, a list of all the of all the great champions I shared a microphone with because um, it, it was really something special. So obviously, one of the biggest events that you covered over time was definitely the Twenty Four Hours of Le Mans. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I kind of got two that go into one kind of. What was the most bizarre moment at Le Mans? I think I know what you're going to say. Um, I don't know. Well, what are you thinking of? <laughs> I'm thinking you're going to say 2016 Toyota. Oh, well, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, your heart goes out to Toyota, who found so many ways to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory there. Yeah. And then also, what year did you guys stop going to Le Mans and covering it at the track? Um, well, we were certainly in studio for that finish. Oh, we got ourselves in the bizarre situation where... The booth announcers would actually go to Le Mans, testing and scrutineering and all that sort of thing, and gather up all the information we could. Because if there's one thing about television, face-to-face questions to someone elicit very different answers than email or even phone calls. So we would fly there, get all the information we could, then fly back to the United States on the Friday on Saturday from a studio in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey, thinking back on Le Mans, which is my favorite race in the world, the high point, there are two races that come to mind. One was 1980, 1989, was it? The year Jaguar came back and won, finally. 88. With the walking cars. Yeah. Yeah. It was just insane. Yeah, the, you know, the Porsche, Klaus Ludwig took the Porsche around, missed his pit lap, ran it out of fuel, had to come back on the starter motor. Jaguar might not have won, but they tried so hard and so long. And when it appeared they would win, suddenly we had this influx of fans just across the English Channel, seeing that their cars were going to win what they always considered their race, a British race on French soil. And those Jags came across the line. The place just thundered. I mean, I almost choked up on the air. It's about the only time in my career that's happened. It was just so emotional. And then, of course, you know, Mercedes got their win after that. And then with this incredible effort by Volker Wiedler, Bertrand Gachot, and Johnny Herbert with his crushed feet that he had suffered in a Formula 3000 accident from many years earlier, did a, like a triple stint at the end of that race, had to be lifted out of the car at the end. And again, it was so emotional. that, And, of course, Tom Christensen's ninth win was a high point too i just there's a high point every year it's hard to pick yeah yeah you just mentioned right there uh at the end i just want to clarify since you're 
Uh, audio kind of just cut out there a little bit. You're talking about 1991. That was the final win for a Japanese manufacturer at Le Mans, except for uh, at least until this year, uh, or last year, now 2018, where yep. Toyota finally picked up their victory at Le Mans. I do want to um, jump back here, back uh, about two decades earlier, back when you joined <laughs> Speed Vision, which of course later became Speed uh, after it was bought out by Fox Sports. Uh, you joined Speed Vision in 1999, like you said earlier, um, and then began hosting uh, Speed and CBS's coverage of Champ Car for two seasons in 2002 and 2003. Um, so the only question I have here is what was going on in the seasons between 1999 and 2002 uh, when you began commentating uh, their Champ Car coverage? Well, we had... Um... We had a lot of other programming going on. Uh, I got there in October of 99. Shortly after that, I started working on the Barrett Jackson auctions on our, on our news programs, our anthology programs. Um, did a lot of sports car race coverage. What else was I doing then? In fact, they kind of took me off of Formula One to do the, uh, the champ car coverage because that was a very high priority for us. Yeah, obviously that was sort of at the time of still tensions between IndyCar and then Champ Car. Of course, the merger came later on, but... Um, since he was there, and since you didn't say I couldn't ask this question, where where do you think it all went wrong with, with Cart and Champ Car? Because you were you were there on the ground, and in in a very short time, about six years, they went from having 28 fully funded cars on the grid to being bankrupt. I mean, it's just an unbelievable decline. I mean, is that only because they lack the Indy 500, or, or I mean, how how did how does that end up happening? Uh, well, uh, I suppose just be mismanagement, IRL as it started out, and Champ Car were very different in their leadership. I mean, at, for the Indy Car ranks, there was one boss, and that was Tony George car everybody was a boss you had so many successful businessmen everybody in what they did under the voting system in place at the time because remember champ car decided that it would incorporate itself as a publicly owned company and all of the team owners had shares and it generated all this money and to be honest we started spending money hand over fist on all kinds of things expensive technology you know, fancy award ceremonies with big name entertainment. Uh, and there was just so much chaos. So many people who weren't used to being told no. And basically, you know, spent their way into a problem. But, of course, the overarching thing that IndyCar or the IRL had, there was no question. The Indy 500 was the race that mattered. Even though Long Beach was a big deal, again, some of these other races were were very popular and got great ratings, but the 500 is simply where it's at for championship car racing in America. When the you know the Roger Penske's and Chip Ganassi's and and so on began to waver a bit, when some of the old car owners kind of faded from the scene, like it just it just didn't make business sense to continue as Champ Car anymore. And the uh, an elegant, although Tony George was able to wrap it all up by buying the assets out of bankruptcy is a pretty bruising time. And, uh, and and you raised a great point. I think the biggest tragedy in all of it, so many teams between the leagues combined once told me there were something like 56 teams at the height of the two series competing with one, uh, with one another. And that's a lot of mortgages and you know car payments and college educations and all that kind of stuff. So when it became one league and dropped down to whatever it was, 14, 16, 18 teams, suddenly a lot of people lost their jobs, and that was the real tragedy, unification of American Open Wheel Championship racing. You mentioned right before you talked about uh, the demise of CART slash Champ Car, you mentioned your return to Formula One coverage in 2004, I believe, um, where you stayed full-time until the end of the 2012 season where both you uh, and Speed ended their full-time ties with Formula One coverage. Uh, and there's a lot of change that happened in that uh, well, eight-year span alone, eight, nine-year span where you had 
Uh, you went from V10 engines down to V8. Um, you saw the tire war that was Bridgestone and Michelin. Uh, obviously, there's one question I'm going to have to ask you about that a little bit later. Um, down to just a spec Pirelli tires. Um, so yeah, a lot of changes that went on in that era alone. A lot of driver changes as well. You got to see the rise of Lewis Hamilton, who's now one of the most successful Formula One drivers of all time. Um, but I do want to ask that question that I think you saw coming when I mentioned the Michelin Bridgestone uh, tires is the 2005 US GP. What sort of experience was that like? Because I know that there were... Uh, David, I don't know if you were at this race. I know, Kevin, you were at this race. Talking about the fans who were just absolutely... A nickel throwing bottles onto the track, and well, that was the thing. Like Bob, you had to 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 go across the airwaves. I remember this specifically, and, and tell those of us watching on TV if anybody could get in contact with anybody at the race to tell them to knock it off and stop throwing bottles onto the track. I mean, it was it was insane. It was. I mean, they were putting people's lives in danger. I wasn't one of those people doing that. I was six. <laughs> okay, let me find my list, and I'll cross your name off. <laughs> okay. you know, um, the, the ironic thing about that about that weekend, I think it's the kind of thing a lot of people are going to want to say they were there to witness. Yeah, they're going to think more affectionately about it over time. I mean, they, and, and to me, the whole thing was so unnecessary. Ralph Schumacher had a big crash. Um, the racetrack wouldn't change the layout of the track. Bernie Ecclestone, the all-powerful booba of Formula One, could do nothing to convince the teams to race. It seemed to me the way the Williams cars were set up, problems with their tires. Ricardo Zonta, you'll recall, had a huge spin that was tire-related during, I don't know, it was practice or qualifying. Schumacher had his big crash. But it was only the Williams team. Oh, if the uh, if the Michelin folks went to or uh, went to check with them about what the car setup was, you know, I thought you know nobody seems to be having a problem. So just about everybody was powerless to do anything about it. And of course, the teams did what they did. The Michelin cars all came in, and later on that season, Red Bull cars had terrible tire problems in Turkey, as I recall, uh, popping tires and, and creating all kinds of problems. But again, specific to them, was the way they were setting up their cars vis-a-vis -vis the Michelin tires that was causing so many problems. Yeah, I know we were talking in our last episode with Dion von Molke about the politics in motorsports. It plays a way bigger aspect than I think some people expect it to. And I think a lot more people hope it to. Um, yeah. And we didn't know on the day what was going to happen. Everything was rumors. Mm -hmm. Teams are going to meet with Michelin. What are they going to do? They're going to come out. I think it was Peter Windsor, one of our longtime Formula One pit reporters, who had the, the sources that claimed that all going to come in. Nothing you could believe until you saw it happening. And yeah. even then, even then, some, some of the drivers were begging to race anyways. Some of the Michelin yeah, sure. drivers. I'm sure there were lots of drivers who thought, hey, you know, we can handle this. Let's go. I mean, Fernando right. Alonso was a championship leader at the time in a Renault, and they were on Michelin tires. So imagine being in that position. You're in the championship lead. Michael Schumacher is out on track in Bridgestones. He's going to yeah. gain a major advantage on you that weekend. That's what I find funny with all the – when things like tire failures like that, how it becomes a more specific team. Because I remember – IndyCar at Texas when they had to do that those yellows like every 20 laps. I remember that was a Penske problem and they had to go under yellow every 10 laps for Penske's failure. So it's it's funny when these fa the failures when it comes down to one team how it affects everybody. I was going to say that too because we even saw that kind of I believe it was at Phoenix a couple years ago too. One team's having failures, especially one like Penske in that situation. Of course they're going to do something about it and cause calamity for everybody else yep there's usually more to the situation than meets the eye i never thought of it like that actually in all honesty didn't didn't sauber pull out of lamar one year because their tires were failing i, I seem <laughs> to remember that vaguely that was my first per in-person visit to lamar we're staying in a little uh auberge out on the backstretch on the kink 
Parkway, which had no chicanes in it at the time, and sharing the backyard, the, the place I was staying back right up against the road that becomes a racetrack on race weekend. A bunch of um, cameramen from Japan to perch their camera up in a tree in the backyard so they could look down the straightaway. So they're coming by, and they don't speak English, these Japanese guys, and I don't speak Japanese, so I'm watching as darkness falls and you hear the engines firing up and the roads are closed and the cars and trucks disappear and then the racing cars come out and go by and come out saying, you know, here comes a Porsche. Here comes a Porsche. Oh, here comes the Mercedes. Boom! And right in front of us, one of the Sauber Mercedes explodes what was a Michelin tire and just bits of rubber and carbon fiber floated down out of the skies for about the next minute and a half. I used to have a chunk of the car that landed right in front of me. That, and yeah, they couldn't reasonable explanation as to why this tire failed at top speed on the uh, Le Mans straight and uh, pulled the entire team, which I thought was a, a very brave move. Of course, they weren't fully Mercedes then. They were the Kuros Salvers painted them silver and started calling them true factory Mercedes. But one way or another, I mean, they were fabulous cars, and it, yeah, they pulled out of the race, but they really had no choice, I guess. Yeah, Mercedes and Le Mans just doesn't go well together now, does it? They've had their struggles. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I don't want to even bring up. Um, but I, I, what I do want to bring up here, how is that for a nice leeway, Kyle, bringing it back? I like um, leeways. <laughs> Is uh, we just talked about um, the end of your Formula One full time broadcasting career in 2012. Well, after that, you moved on. You're still hired by Fox, but you also got to do some events uh, with NBC Sports. Fox allowed you, I think, three F1 races uh, per season for NBC. So you got to do a couple of those, filling in for Lee Diffie. I know you mentioned a sickness uh, that Lee had before uh, we actually started recording. Uh, so you got to cover some select F1 races along with some select IndyCar races as well. What did I do? Oh, yeah, I did Indy as well. I did Toronto one year. Um, not sure what else, because... I think you did Pocono, Pocono, too. You're right. We'll kind of run together after a while. Uh, the, the IndyCar races were from site, which was great. And the Formula One stuff was all you know from the studio, which was fine, too, because I was working with Hobbs and Matchett again, which was fun. So I mentioned that you remained with Fox Sports during this time, so you actually got to continue their coverage of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Uh, you stayed there full-time, what was it, 2015 was your final season doing that championship full-time? Uh, 16, I believe. Um, and when Fox Sports picked up the rights to the World Endurance Championship in the United States, you actually ended up commentating that as well, alongside Calvin Fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, that includes the 24 Hours of Le Mans. You mentioned earlier your favorite race to cover, um, favorite race in the world. Uh, and that just brings us right now to where you are currently uh, as a commentator for the World Feed for the ABB Formula E Championship alongside Jack Nichols and Dario Franchitti. Uh, quite a different experience to what you've done in the past. What is it like to be a commentator on such a new and growing series? Oh, it's great fun. Uh, you know, Jack and Dario are, are, are terrific announcers. Uh, Mickey Shields also works with us, and we've recently introduced a guy named Vernon Kay, who is a, uh, a well-known British broadcaster for those races. One for, uh, for the British audience and a parallel world feed for anybody who wants the commentary of the English language. You know, we go to the races once again, which has always been uh, a high priority for me. It's a very relaxed uh, paddock. I think they're all highly qualified. They're all paid. There's no, uh, nobody's renting a drive in Formula E. We now have nine teams among the 11 teams on the grid. Porsche is coming next year. Mercedes is coming the year after that. So we'll have all four German factories involved along with uh, uh, the new Generation 2 car this year, which is more powerful with better battery life. Lap records everywhere. The drivers love driving it. I'm not sure how they felt about Santiago 
where we had temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit ambient, and the track started to break up a bit at the end, and that, that caused people some problems. It's a great gypsy crowd. You know, motorsports is a traveling community, and, um, and that's, that's part of its charm for me. And Formula E is just a, a spectacular a bunch of people that I love being around. The technology is very different. I mean, partially. You know, a lot of people take sides in this battle between internal combustion engines and all-electric racing. I don't think it needs to be that way. Just look at the way the manufacturers worldwide are piling into electric technology. That doesn't mean the internal combustion engine is going away. At least as far as I can see, that it'll be that much better in the future to have gas-powered cars. Vintage set, I mean, people will want these cars to keep and drive because they're the cars that they grew up with, and, and we'll be racing them for a long time to come. The question is whether you're going to be driving them down the street, wherever it is that you live. Yeah. Places like France and China, where the government has put on when the last internal combustion engine powered vehicle will be sold. It's a problem, but uh, I don't see that on the horizon for us here in the United States. All right. Uh, that pretty much leads us into the final segment of the show where we're just going to ask you some questions that people have submitted through Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'm going to start the first one here. Uh, it's from CanCool33 on Twitter. This is kind of a heavy hitter question, so I promise the ones after this will hopefully be a little bit easier. But uh, to the best of your ability, could you describe what the economics of a channel like Velocity, now Motor Trend, or Mav TV, uh, simulcasting the in house feed of something like the event in Mexico City last weekend, which was the Race of Champions, or the right. Chili Bowl or Baja 1000? Uh, yeah, and I owe uh, that particular. Uh Submitter, uh, an apology. I did get the uh, the question he submitted to me by uh, uh, Twitter back from an overnight flight from Santiago, and I had family in town, and we have this big football game we're playing in Atlanta this weekend that everybody seems to be excited about. Oh yeah. So it's, you know, it just got tough to to get back to him. <laughs> you know, a lot of people ask why why isn't everything televised? Why not this? Why not that? It's a very expensive proposition, first of all. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it varies. Each case is different. Is it an oval track? Is it a road course? How many cameras do you need? What are they going to cost? What are the costs of doing business and insurance? How many people do you need? You got to pay them. You got to transport them. You got to house them. You got to feed them. Get pretty stout. Now, I'm not sure what right, an in-house fee. I'm not aware of too many. Foot on, but you know, build complete broadcast worthy shows as opposed to just cameras that show everybody on big screens what's going on on the track. Uh, if I have an event like a chili bowl or a race of champions where we do build a feed, wants to broadcast it, I'm going to charge them for it. I mean, it's a, it's a business and you've got to cover your costs. So uh, I think that writer in his note to me asked, would it cost anything? And I think I can assure you, yes, it definitely would. It's the result of a negotiation between business people. It was supported by commercials. Uh, you know, again, is the subject to a negotiation. And, and these things are all very different. So I can't really put a price on a particular event. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this one because this is kind of what I was uh, thinking about asking. And I'm glad someone asked it. Uh, Alex Flinney and Matt Skipper. Uh, both ask, and they, they uh, said they are inspired to pursue a career as a broadcaster, and they asked, how did you get started in motorsports commentary, and any words of advice for someone trying to do the same? Yeah, I get that question a lot, and my answer is, I don't know, because my job found me. Um, as I think I talked about earlier, I mean, I was practicing law and running marathons and running my little track club and having a big old time here in Atlanta. And I got invited to do a TV show, and on the basis of that event, TV, I, I took no classes. I was a part of no film or broadcast program in college. Broadcasting is storytelling, and advocating in the law is storytelling. So I think the two are similar in lots and lots of ways. But to their point about how to get started uh, any way you can, uh, 
there's uh, you know the internet out there. There's there's lots of content. Some of it, you know, frankly, is pretty humble. But again, I would do it. You know, your local TV station. Can you you know go out to the local racetrack with these crews and do things? Can you be a PA announcer at your local track? Can you write for the local newspaper? You know, just just use your imagination. Be willing to work for very little compensation and uh, and get in. Heck, you know, sweep the floors if you need to to get in. It's like getting a job as a racing driver. You're going to be a driver. Do anything in a racing shop that gets you in the door and then work from there. It's much the same with a career in broadcast communications. Get into the industry any way you can, however humbly. Listen more than you talk and look for opportunities and I don't think there's a, a, a given path to a broadcast opportunity to follow. David, is that at all ringing a bell with you? Yeah, it totally know. was. I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a person who is kind of taking a, a different avenue to try to break into to motorsports. And, and everything you said almost described my experience exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Cool. Um, going to the next question here, uh, this is from AXX underscore 68 and Ian Perez. You are the voice of many racing telecasts like F1, IMSA, and Formula E. My question is, which series did you enjoy covering the most? <laughs> um, wow. You know, that's like asking which of your children you love the most. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mentioned earlier that, that broadcasting is storytelling, so I like to go wherever the best stories are. Uh, stories out there about how people got where they are, the effort they're putting in, and, you know, everybody is. is. I started with sports cars, uh, and I think they really remain my first love, simply because to the grassroots level of motorsports is still there. Sports car racing can be very professional, but, you know, they all succeed on the backs of well-funded enthusiasts who just like to go out there and race. If they can race with the pros, great. I think it's a tremendous arc where you get to know these personalities coming along. And you get to talk about them when they're, they're racing at the highest levels of a place like Daytona or Sebring or uh, Tech Raceway Laguna Seca or Mid-Ohio or, or Le Mans or Monza or spa Frankershon. I think sports cars... Are, are great fun, both the prototypes and the GTs. If I had to pick, I'd say sports car racing is, is probably my favorite. And then the second half question, <clears throat> also, do you have any thoughts on NBC's first telecast of the Rolex 24? And if NBC were to give you an opportunity on the com to do the commentary on IMSA telecast, would you take it? And to add to that, before the show started, I already advocated for uh, Bob to take over for Rutledge next year in the infield. So. <laughs> I'd love to cover sports cars with NBC again. They're a great bunch of people. As I said, they put to work. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. You mentioned great stories, Bob. And one of those this weekend was, uh, or last weekend, was Alex Zanardi. And you were there when he did his final 13 laps. Is Alex Zanardi's story one of the greatest in motorsport history? Oh, I think so. I think so, you know, I... With all due respect, that has gone before. I watched the race. Paul Page was calling it uh, in Germany when, when Alex had his injury. About a year later, Speed sent me to Monaco, where Alex lives. He had already built up his upper body so that he could move around easily, in and out of his prosthetic legs easily, and even joke about him. Like he'll sit down and, and spin the ball joint at his knee and turn one leg upside down, and he can put his coffee on the bottom of his shoe, which is now pointing at the ceiling. Be as tall as I want to be. If I want to be short, I just shorten my legs. If I want to be tall, I just lengthen them. His boat in Monaco Harbor, called Matuna, uh, Hatuna Makata from the Lion King, he would hurl himself off the back of this boat, off the transom, into the harbor, swim around for a while, hoist himself up, and scoot around this boat amazing way so incredibly agile with just these stumps that are left of his legs and it, you know it's just a great story and of course his medals and his, his post-accident career is just magic to me 
Yeah, I heard a story from Dr. Der- Terry Trammell that when Zanardi came to uh, out of his coma, he looked down and said, oh, thank God the third leg's still there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe that 100%. I mean, that is Alex. He is just the most amazing human being. Proved it once again. I mean, he, you know, he took the challenge of the weather at Daytona and he raced in it. Mm-hmm. Which, there was a point know, in the race where he outbreaks some prototypes. I was I was just like giddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. I mean there's no doubt that he is one of the greatest people of all time, let alone drivers. Final couple of questions here. Steven Killsdonk again asked another question. He said, What's it like working with a loose cannon like Tommy Kendall as the analyst? <laughs> Well, don't let any loose cannon remarks from TK fool you. He is a really brilliant guy. I mean, Tommy has an economics degree from UCLA. He's an active investor. He is of the thinking race car driver. And I found this over the years with a lot of people I've worked with, with you know, Benny Parsons and Bobby Unzer and Danny Sullivan and David Hobbs. And you can be the biggest fan of racing in the world, and I guarantee that a veteran driver that little bit differently who can who can see what the car is doing who can extrapolate from that what needs to happen in the next pit stop and so on and so forth and tommy really is a genius when it comes to that sort of thing he is constantly thinking about the whole race the big picture as well as as what's going on in a given car right in front of him so has that that just murderous sense of humor and he will go out there some of the years we did uh champ car together I mean, tommy said some things on the air that that just made me shrink right out of my chair <laughs> we had a lot of fun together and certainly tommy has paid his dues and had tremendous success and uh, a lot of fun to be around steven also asked uh how your hair always looks so perfect i don't know how we keep getting these questions because I remember somebody asked the exact same thing in the Zach Veach episode. Yeah, so yeah there was a hair question in that one, too. We get the weird questions, What's man. your hair routine, Bob? Uh, I don't really have one. It's kind of wash and wear, like my clothes. Uh, but I do get that a lot. I've always liked to wear my hair long. Yeah, I remember many years ago shooting a, an on-camera stand-up on the roof the restroom complex at Daytona, down in, in one of the NASCAR turns. Windy day. And I look down, and it's basically me and the cameraman on the roof. There's practically nobody else in the racetrack because the event hasn't happened. And there's this guy with a a camera up at me. So I'm finished what I'm doing, and I go down, and I say, you know what, that can't be much of a picture. What are you looking for? He said, well, I just took it because your hair was blowing around, and my wife insists you wear a hairpiece. So I just wanted to show her that's not the case. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hair has been a big deal. Nikki Shields from Formula E was teasing me about my hair as recently as the uh, chili weekend. <laughs> uh, and lastly, he also asked what you like to do if you have time to fill like the NBCSN crew had this past weekend uh, when they had a lot of the NASCAR guys going to Daytona. Um, you still Were you uh, involved in the, the golf matches with Lee and Calvin? No. No, you weren't part of that, no? No. And, you know, I, I try to stay out of the line of fire when Lee and Calvin start going at each other. They're, <laughs> they're longtime friends. They've got this needle that they give each other all the time about who's taller than whom and who's going <laughs> better than who's and just on and on and on and on. You know? So it's uh, I'm going to avoid the shrapnel and stay to one side and pick my fights elsewhere. Well, at least with those two commentating together, at least nobody's going to have to stand on a bucket or anything anymore. That's right. Yeah, just point the camera down, and you can get them both in the same shot. Last couple questions here for this episode. Um, Jamal Stallings and Open Wheeler eighty six both asked, uh, "What was your favorite race to call to this day? If you could pick one, um, that would probably be Le Mans, although." Uh, we had some great Formula One moments. I mean, the Formula One race I remember most was the season finale in Brazil. Uh, Lewis Hamilton picked up the sixth place he needed to cement the championship over Felipe Massa. And poor Felipe, who deserved a ch- that title as much as anybody, won the race. 
Raj went crazy, including his father, Antonio. Meanwhile, out on the track, as the rain was falling harder and harder, Lewis Hamilton and his McLaren was able to overtake uh, Timo Glock, who had stayed out on slicks in the wet for Toyota, and caught him basically on the last corner of the last lap of the season and took the title back. And poor Felipe's dad had to be told of that on camera in the garage. Any Lama that stands out in particular for the, the favorite one you've ever commentated or ever watched before? Well, the favorite one would probably be that Jaguar win in 88, mm -hmm. uh, which was such an emotional moment. And one of my earliest Lamas. Yep. Christensen's Audi success was, uh, was good fun. I was personally hoping he was going to say 2008. Mm -hmm. Audi versus Peugeot in the rain. Oh, yeah. And the last question before we wrap it all up, I'm going to give this one to David. David, you were talking to Stephen on Twitter yesterday. You said you were going to ask him one question uh, in particular. I thought about this, And I'm going to leave this I all for you. Too. Oh, no. Bob, I need you to explain to me what a shamazel is. I've been wondering since 1998 when you called, described Greg Moore piling in to a bunch of cars at Portland uh, as a shamazel. Uh, what, what exactly is a shamazel? I'm confused. Well, a shamazel is the result when you get a car cattywampus and find yourself <laughs> in a spot you can't get out of. Shamazel is a that's a that's a word among many that I uh, that I stole from David Hobbs. It's Mr. a synonym Glass. for argy bargy. Yeah, it's like argy bargy. It's um, a shunt, a crash, uh, you know, a collision. Uh, what a shamazel is, and and so many of those words came from Hobbs. And so many of them come from the racers themselves. I think some of those guys just get bored and try to come up with different words to describe situations. And certainly the the Brits that I work with on Formula E are just full of them. And it's uh, kind of fun to hang around and pick one up here and there. And I looked it up, and according to Wikipedia and Urban Dictionary, it is a real word. So, Tobs <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> get residuals for that, then, if it's a real word? Well, you know, somebody actually took his uh, his phrase, mind the clag, lad, and made a T-shirt out of it, and Hobbs knew nothing about it, so somebody owes him a check. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how much money Kimi Raikkonen is making out of, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh. I, I will say my favorite one is uh, RG Bargy, because I remember when that was coined. Yeah? Yeah, Le Mans 2013, when the P2 leader spun right in front of uh, the number two Audi that was leading overall. Huh? Calvin uses that. That was a, lot, a Calvin so. Fish one, too. Yeah, that's sort of Calvin's phrase. <laughs> yeah, and then it kind of stuck, and now we hear it every Daytona. Yep. Every yeah, sports car race in general, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. It's been enough trouble as it is. I yeah. figure if you don't send people to the dictionary at least once a broadcast, you're not doing your job. <laughs> Uh, that's going to pretty much be a wrap for this episode. Bob, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute honor to have you on the show. Um, like I said before, we actually started recording. You've been commentating races uh, much longer than I've been born. David has probably heard your voice on TV since 97, 98, I'd have to assume. Probably yeah. earlier than oh, yeah. that. Man, that, that, was, that was my childhood. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, again, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, you probably are the only person I've ever talked to to this day. I never thought it'd be topped, uh, but I think that you actually have more motorsport knowledge than Kevin. It so I'd give you a pat on <laughs> oh, the back no. for that. Oh, I'm serious. I mean, Bob has said some things this episode. I was like, how do you remember that? It's like it's only something Kevin would remember, but uh, hey, you've got years of experience in the bag. All right. Well, thanks very much. I enjoyed it. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this one. Uh, to anybody listening to this, you can check out the rest of our episodes by clicking the card at the top right of the YouTube video. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, uh, just check us out. Uh, subscribe to the podcast so you can uh, not miss a future episode. We've got some more specials lined up in the future, and we hope to see you all there.